My name is Pellis, this is Karthik, and we're going to be talking about security response in the age of mass customized attacks. So uh, what we're, do, we're going to do is we're going to give you a little bit of an introduction to what uh, mass customization means. And mass customization is actually a business term. Uh, so we're going to give you a little bit of a business background. But don't worry, this is a hack in the box talk. We are going to show details from the exploits we've been analyzing. and give you the technical content that you sort of expect from hacking the box. The reason why we're, we're sort of looking at this from a business perspective, though, is because everybody sort of looks at APT threats from a different angle, right? If you watch a soccer game and I'm behind one goal and Karthik's behind another goal, we'll have two completely different views of the game, even though we're watching the same event. And in the security industry, as we watch, you know, AP attacks in the wild and we watch the other days prof propagate in the wild, the same sort of thing happens. Like, the AV people have their view from where they're sitting, vendors have our view where we're sitting. And uh, by taking a look at the, the concept of mass customization in business, you get a different view in terms of where exploits are going that you wouldn't normally get just through technical analysis. And we can use that to inform how we, we do some of our security response, because certain businesses involve in certain ways regardless of the product they're selling. So we can, we can expect the the zero-day uh, commercialization to follow those sort of same business trends. So uh, please you know, stick with us. There is definitely technical content. Actually, the majority of this presentation is technical content, but we're going to start by giving you a, a brief intro into uh, what it means. For background, Karthik and I both work uh, as part of Adobe's uh, security answer response team. We refer to the product security incident response team called PCERT. So if you send a zero-day uh, to Adobe, he, either he or I will be the first ones to analyze it. Uh, so we have spent a lot of time with these zero days. We are the people that uh, take a look at, at these attacks. Uh, if it's Flash Player, it's usually me. If it's Reader, it's usually Karthik. Uh, in some cases, we both jump in and work on it. For instance, in the Reader zero day, we're sort of racing each other to, um, to see who can analyze it first, just out of personal competition. Uh, but basically, when people find stuff and they send it into PCERT, it's going to follow sort of the process you would expect for, for most companies in terms of uh, coming into us. We create a tracking number. We give it back to you. Um, if you happen to have any uh, research you want to share with us, please find us afterwards. Uh, we'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. Um, and we also work with a, the larger team called Asset, which is the proactive team within Adobe that works with product teams to create fixes once we've done the analysis. Uh, we work with researchers to verify published bulletins. Uh, we're a partner in the M Microsoft Active Protection Program for getting vulnerability information out to the AV and IDS vendors and the IDS vendors. So uh, part of what we we're doing, you know, when we're doing this research and we're looking at these zero days from February, um, is not only taking a look at how they're technically crafted, but also trying to figure out what we could learn from them in terms of that we could feed back into our, our secure development lifecycle processes to, to make our software better. So now I'm going to turn everything over to Karthik, and he's going to give you the background on uh, mass customization. Thank you, Bills. Can everyone hear me OK? All right. So the first part of this talk is, uh, is about some business concepts and uh, the trends we're seeing in uh, export creation we think are related to some of these business concepts. So let's begin with mass customization. Um, what is mass customization? A little bit of history before we get started. It's actually a concept attributed to Stanley Davis, a business consultant and a former business professor at Harvard, Columbia, and Boston University. He first introduced this concept in a book in 1987. The title of that book is Future Perfect. So how did he define mass customization? Well, he defined it as the customization and personalization of products and services for an individual customer at a mass production price. Another way of saying that is uh, effectively postponing the task of differentiating a product for a specific customer until the latest possible point in a supply network. Now, traditionally, customization and low costs have been mutually exclusive. 
Mass production was cheap, but it didn't go hand in hand with customization. And customization was the mainstay of product designers and craftsmen. So let's look at a classic example um, from the automobile industry to understand mass customization, mass production, and customization a little better. And this example comes from the Ford Model T. There are many of the same kind with little or no variation. Um, and Henry Ford is uh, famously uh, said to have said about the Model T, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. Now in contrast to the um, massive numbers of replicas of the Model T, is a different kind of example. This is a, a custom replica of a Bugatti from an auto show. And what's different here is that there's not, um, there's not thousands or millions of copies, but rather just a handful. And this is an example of customization in contrast to mass production in the Model T. Now, another business consultant, Joseph Pine, discusses the spread of mass customization into other industries um, in his book entitled Mass Customization. ATMs are an example of how mass customization entered the financial industry. Now, with your ATM card, you could go to any bank, most places in the world, and experience customized service from your financial institution, which is only one of thousands. And how many people here have designed their own PCs? Let's see a show of hands. How many people have designed their own PCs? All right, about 20%. So that's an example of mass customization in the, in the PC hardware industry as well. So you can design your own PC from a lot of different components from a lot of different suppliers. So as a business idea, mass customization uh, can be found in automobiles, manufacturing, electronics, and the list really goes on. And the, the premise of this talk that Pellis and I are giving is that this trend, um, we can say, is now applying to export creation. And what we're seeing is that the beginning of mass malware becoming mass customized attacks. And in the rest of this talk, we're going to give you a little bit of evidence that, thinks, uh, that shows that this trend is beginning. All right, so let's, let's cover a little bit of ground. Most of you should be familiar with this already, but uh, mass malware is an example of something that's, that's mass produced. And uh, like most of you know, some examples of exploit kits include Black Hole, Phoenix, MPAC, Crime Pack, Eleanor. Um, of course, export kits support multiple browsers, multiple versions of browsers, and uh, different versions of plugins, you know, Java, Adobe Reader, Adobe Flash. Um, and the neat thing about export kits is that they're very modular. You know, you could add, if, you, if you're the bad guy who's making these export kits, you could create a new module and, and plug it in. It's plug and play for any module. And not only are, are the modules that, that uh, induce a crash and uh, divert code, execution uh, modular, but also the payloads. So whatever is delivered to a victim upon successful compromise is also modular. Um, one of the, uh, the, the idea of zero-day exploits being repurposed as modules uh, comes from Dan Guido's Exploit Intelligence Project. So that's a useful reference if anyone is interested. OK, so export kits can be served from anywhere. And the malware that's uh, served on successful compromise can also come from anywhere. They're relatively cheap in the order of $1,000. And it's commonly agreed that you know, criminal enterprises, organized groups, or gangs are behind these things. Just last week, there was a, a news story on ZDNet about the hackers behind the uh, Carburet botnet uh, who were arrested. So it's an organized group that's uh, putting this out. It's a business. Moving right along. This paper by Kohlberg et al., A Taxonomy of Obfuscating Transformations, is a wonderful reference on obfuscation. And it provides a common terminology for discussing obfuscation. So these guys provide three characteristics um, concerning the quality of obfuscation transformations. And we'll discuss these in light of the obfuscations we see in mass malware and which we do not see in targeted attacks. So what are these characteristics? One, potency. This refers to the degree to which an analyst who is deobfuscating an exploit is frustrated. Second, resilience. This refers to the resistance to automatic deobfuscation of exploits. And third, cost. This is the overhead to the application. Now, this, is kind of, this can be kind of a tricky concept to, to grok, but um, let's say um, an exploit covers multiple different uh, versions of an application. In terms of this terminology, the cost of the application would be high. So you're going to hear me refer to um, a, a lot of these terminology uh, in the coming slides, so it's good to keep these three terms in mind. Now, on another axis, um, in contrast to Kohlberg's terminology, we can just look at basic technical characteristics of an exploit. Does it support multiple operating systems, multiple kinds of payloads, multiple service packs? This is more commonly discussed in our industry. 
And how complex is the obfuscation, right? So I'm, I'm going to walk through um, the process of deobfuscating a piece of malware, CV2010-0188, which, according to the Contagion malware dump, is found in all those different kinds of exploit kits. So it's a pretty good example, representative example, of the characteristics in mass malware um, that are indicative of complexity and, and uh, obfuscation. And it might actually surprise you to learn that uh, despite this exploit being almost three years old, it's actually one of the most common exploits that we in Adobe PCERT receive on a regular basis. So it's a representative example. All right. So if you read Cole Bergdahl's paper, he goes through some different kinds of terminology to, um, to describe and, and catalog correctly the types of obfuscation. Here you see some variable names being split. Um, they're scattered all over the place. So there's, there's data obfuscation. Um, there's a little bit of layout obfuscation because it's hard to read the code. So let's call this layer one. All right. So if you spend a little bit of time within a JavaScript debugger, you can arrive at something like this. It's a little more readable, basically the same JavaScript rewritten. Uh, some of the variables are renamed. The JavaScript is normalized. And the layout is a little more friendly to whoever's reading it. And from, from this representation, it's possible for us to induce or deduce excuse me, some kind of functionality. Let's call this layer two. So part of the, what the exploit is doing is clear, but, but not always. So we've got to continue the obfuscation. Let's call this layer three. So we get to this layer. There's a form field name whose, um, whose purpose is, is it known. We've got to continue deobfuscation to get to the bottom of what this exploit is doing. And then when you continue down that path, you're led to other variables. It looks like a string of uh, hexadecimal numbers. What does that do? Spend more time on it. Get to layer five. All right, so finally, you, know, you, you spend a bit of time on this, get, to get through five layers of obfuscation. And uh, it's sort of clear what is, what is this exploit doing. So um, the heap is being sprayed with some, some shell code. And then there's a variable naz, N-A-Z. Um, what is that? So within the document object model of um, JavaScript within PDFs, it's possible for variables to reference other parts of the PDF. And if you were only analyzing this stream, uh, there was no other reference to N-A-Z. So the NAZ was actually a variable that was from a different part, from a different stream in, in the DOM. And that's where um, a TIFF image, which was triggering a bug in Reader, was being loaded from. So the heap had been primed with shellcode, and then a different part of the, the PDF was invoked to load this TIFF image, which cra crashed Reader. And um, then control will flow into the shellcode. So it's a, it's a relatively complex um, exploit to, to reverse engineer. but. It takes about five layers. So in Kohlberg at all's terminology, you would say that this is a highly potent and resilient exploit. All right, so we just looked at a technical walkthrough of CV2010-0188, but what does that tell us about mass production? Exploit kits, you could say, are specialized machines with various interchangeable parts. And in the example we just saw, CV2010-0188, you could say that is an interchangeable part within any kind of exploit kit. It could be hosted anywhere and serve malware from anywhere. And it's low cost partly because um, the module for the exploit can be changed in and out. And again, the Exploit Intelligence Project is a, is a good reference for that. So I'm going to contrast everything I told you about the features of mass malware by giving you an example of a targeted zero-day attack and talking about some of the features that are unique to that kind of attack. So back in December of uh, 2011, um, we in Adobe PCERT were sent a, a malicious PDF file by a partner. And the accompanying message was just something like, looks like a zero day um, crashes Reader 946. So at the time, Reader 946 was the most current version of Reader. And uh, when, when you're analyzing malicious PDFs, if something is affecting the most current version of your platform, that's what you're most concerned with. All right, so we took apart, the, took apart this exploit. Um, there was some. Um, so heap spray stuff going on, it's not very complex. Uh, you, you could say it's low potency. There was some variable renaming, so it wasn't immediately clear what the control flow was. However, with just a single line of um, um, Perl and string matching and replacing, you could easily get past that level of obfuscation. And so you could, you could say there's just one layer of obfuscation, and it's low potency and low resilience. In fact, I would conjecture that this level of obfuscation was just enough to bypass heuristic checks in antivirus at the time. And there was no need to over-engineer this exploit to go past any other kind of AV. Well, what about version checking? 
One of the features in mass malware that we'll talk about, cost, is proportional to the number of versions that are supported by an application. Now, at first glance, it, it may seem like this targeted attack supports multiple versions. But in fact, that's not the case. One of the first people um, outside of Adobe, an independent researcher, to also um, take apart this exploit, um, Brandon Dixon. He said something like, like most JavaScript observed in other malicious files, checks are done for the proper version number before main routines are executed. What is interesting about this document is that it checks for versions that do not exist and makes a point to redirect the user to an infinite loop, assuming they're running a version greater than 10. So to, to recap that, there wasn't too much complex obfuscation in the way the heap spring was done. And then only a particular version of Reader was targeted, the latest version of Reader 9 at the time. In conclusion, this exploit contained features of a targeted zero-day attack. And uh, the people who wrote this exploit perhaps did not need to support other versions of Reader because the organization they were going after um, was only running, say, Reader 9, and there was no economic need or otherwise to target Reader 10. So I'm going to hand it back to Pellis, and uh, we're going to continue the discussion of features specific to targeted zero-day attacks. Right. So we, thus far, we've been talking about uh, reader zero days that we, we've seen in the wild. Uh, but the features that Karthik has, has described are limited to reader. We see this in other malware that we analyze. Uh, for instance, this is from CV 2011 20, uh, 2110. And this was a flash player zero day that uh, we dealt with in 2011. And it had a couple of uh, interchangeable parts to it. The first was that the URL for the payload was passed in as an obfuscated string uh, to the Swift, so they could repurpose the Swift over and over again with different payloads just by uh, changing the variable that they passed into it. Um, and they also uh, did version checking to make sure that it worked with the most recent versions of re uh, Flash Player. So uh, these, these techniques can be seen in a lot of different malware. If you look through it, it's, it's fairly common for a lot of, a lot of groups. Um, so what, what's the differentiator for mass customization? Most of these things, the interchangeable parts, uh, the, the obfuscation, those are all things that are evident in mass production. You can see those in malware. But what are the things that actually make, um, make this malware and these attacks classify as mass customization? And this table here is uh, from Joseph Pine's book on mass customization. It talks about uh, features in the competitive landscape of the 1990s that help drive mass customization. Uh, one of those was cycle time reduction. Uh, another one was quick response. So uh, one of the things that makes you go from mass production to mass customization is the need to be able to meet customer needs faster. Right? With mass production, you can provide stuff to, uh, to a large number of people, but they all get the same box. Like if you go into, if you go into, a, if you go into a store, uh, whatever's on the shelf is what you get. And that's different from a desktop PC market where you can sit there and every person can order their own version of, of their Dell PC or Gateway PC. Um, you need to be able to provide people with a customized response at a much quicker rate. And in the security industry, one of the things that's been happening on the defensive side is the need to turn things over uh, more quickly. This is a graph from, uh, that covers all Adobe products in terms of our response time to uh, vulnerabilities that are reported to us. Uh, back in 2008, we, our average cross company was around uh, 55 days, and now we have that driven down to under 14 days for our zero day response time. So the uh, zero days that occurred in February that we were dealing with, the three flash player zero days, the, the reader zero day, all those were able to turn around in less than 14 days. And in addition to that, the ability for us to distribute patches uh, to a large customer base has also increased. For instance, within Flash Player, we have a background updater now. And that background updater will check for updates every single day. So you know, yesterday, we, we pushed out a patch that had the Pondone fix uh, from Cansec West. And probably by the end of this week, when we're all flying home, uh, probably about 3 quarters of, of the people that run Flash Player will have that patch if they're, um, if they're running the background updater. Right? So what we've done is, for the people that create mass malware kits, is those zero days have a much shorter shelf life, right? They had, your zero days, uh, it's much harder for those zero days to have an effect over a longer period of time because the vendors are responding quicker and we're also shipping updates to, to end users faster. So that's where you start to get to this, this mass customization idea where you have the platform, you have, 
you basically have these frameworks for delivering exploits to customers, and they, they have interchangeable charts. You can, you can dynamically pass in payloads. You can choose which obfuscation technique you want to be able to use. Uh, you can have the, some of the shell code sort of genericized for different versions. And that allows you to do mass production of those zero days and get them out through uh, your crimeware kits. But for the people that are, that are marketing these zero days, they need to be able to do mass customization. They need to be able to plug in zero day exploits uh, on a fairly rapid basis so that they can do the turnover they need such that customers uh, can get exploits working at a much faster rate. Because as soon as I give it to one guy and that guy gets caught, the zero day is burned. So now I got to give it another zero, I have to have a different zero day to give to my other customer because the first one got burned. And I need to be able to turn that over fairly quickly. Um, so if we take a look at uh, CV uh, 2013, no, 633, now we're starting to get into the zero days that uh, were in February. There was a lot of attacks going on in February. There were three different Flash Player zero days and a reader zero day, all within a very short period of time. Um, I'm not sure who was mad at who, but they were definitely shooting each other in, in a digital warfare game. Um, this one was a Flash Player uh, vulnerability. It's one of the first ones we patched. And it was, a, it was an attack against fonts. Uh, they, they found a font parsing bug uh, in a font called Diablo, and they, they exploited that within Flash Player. And they had some of the things that you would expect in a mass-produced Swift, where they have the version checking there. And they have, the component, uh, they have things broken down into components, which is another aspect of, of mass production. So if you look at the shell code here, or if you look at the, the action script code here, they've, they've got their layout of the attack fairly well segmented. They have build ROP, they have build shell code, get memory at, write memory at. A lot of these functions get repurposed in a lot of, lot of Swifts. So you'll, um, you'll see them from time to time. And the part that is specific to the zero day is basically lo the load font, uh, because that was what they needed for this particular instance of the zero day. So you still have those uh, interchangeable parts from mass production along with, with the zero day attacks. Another one that we dealt with uh, that came in at almost the exact same time was CV 2013-0634, and this was known as the Lady Boyle attack. And this one was really, really interesting uh, in terms of its overall sophistication. It was definitely uh, the work of people that knew what they were doing, taking the time to QE it on everything, and creating a truly vicious uh, uh, attack. So one of the things that uh, it used is this is the exploit that used uh, the vector heap spray methodology that Haifei Lei wrote a paper on. Um, if you haven't seen this paper, uh, I suggest you read it. But it was a, a fairly complex, relatively new uh, method for doing heap sprays in Flash Player. So uh, that component was relatively new. I was able to tie it back to one Swift from uh, 2012. So if you're in the AV group and you like to tie attacks together, uh, the same technique was used in 2012-54. But it only bit, that's the only one that I recall it being used in. And it was a new sophisticated way of doing heap spray exploits. Um, this was the first Flash Player exploit in the six and a half years that I've been at Adobe, where there was a zero day found in the wild that was actually targeting Macs. So it would target either Firefox or Safari on Mac. Um, so they were able to test it there. If it was on Windows, it would be delivered via an Office document. Not, not necessarily something new there. Um, this came out just before we released Click to Play for Office for Flash Player. Now, if, um, if you have a recent version of Flash Player and an Office document tries to instantiate it, we throw up a dialogue saying, hey, we're in Office. Chances are this wasn't what you meant to do. Please click close um, to try to block Office attacks um, as a means for delivering Flash Player exploits. But this came out right before it. So there was a window version delivered via Office documents. Um, the payloads on it were also fairly sophisticated. They had different payloads embedded in the Swift for both 32-bit and 64-bit operating systems. And the 32-bit version was actually digitally signed um, from a certificate issued by Thought originally to a Korean gaming company. It was actually out of date, but it was still digitally signed by something by Thought. So uh, they bothered to sign the payloads. So um, as you can see from this attack, they actually spent a pretty decent amount of time coming up with something that worked wherever you sent it, whether it was Mac or Windows. They had digitally signed payloads to try to bypass uh, some AV checks. Uh, they accounted for different architectures for 32 and 64-bit. 
Um, this was somebody who spent a lot of time uh, working, this, working this out and making it sophisticated. And when I say it supported Windows, I don't just mean XP, Vista, and Win7. They actually made it work for Windows Server versions. So it supported Server 2003, Server 2003 R2, Server 2008, Server 2008 R2. Um, also, in terms of Flash Player uh, support, it supported the last six versions of Flash Player. And this is interesting because uh, at, right now we're shipping Flash Player updates once a month. That's our, our current uh, goal is to, we're, we're clearing out a whole bunch of bugs, so we're shipping things once, once a month scale. That's why you have three different versions of 11.4, three different versions of 11.5. Um, so in order for somebody to write shell code to be able to test against all those versions, you have to keep up to date, right? You have to make sure you keep copies. Every month you go download the latest Flash Player version, keep an update around. You have to have VMs set up to do the matrices of all these different combinations to test in this environment. So they have multiple VMs set up to make sure it's stable in any configuration that it's, it's deployed in. And so um, if you're used to the idea, like if you've wor ever worked as a consultant, you've done consultants, uh, you've worked for companies that don't write specs, and you've had to sort of look at code and infer what the spec was, right? And from looking at this, you can actually look at, look at the list of supported versions and say, all right, somebody had a clear customer requirement uh, from one of their customers that had to support all versions of Windows. Because otherwise, why would you support Flash Player on server? Like, why would you send an Office document to, uh, to support a Windows Server version? There's not that many people opening malicious email attachments from Windows Server. But, you know, if the customer requests all versions of Windows, you make sure it supports all versions of Windows. And so they tested all, all the Windows Server versions as well. So a very sophisticated attack uh, that we saw when we spent some time analyzing. Uh, <clears throat> the third Flash Player bug that we had to deal with in February, um, you know, just two months ago, was uh, reader, or, I'm sorry, uh, Flash Player CV 2013-60, uh, oh, this, sorry, this is the reader zero day. Um, <clears throat> so one of the other bugs that we had to deal with was uh, the reader zero day. And uh, it was sort of complicated in that it's not just one bug. Say I had to escape the sandbox. And uh, so they had more than one bug. They made it actually harder for us to test because we have to test both the, the original crash as well as the sandbox escape. Uh, one buffer overflow, they had one information leak, and they had the sandbox escape. So it was, it was a total of three bugs that we had to go through and pull out the shell code from that and test the patches for each one of those. Because um, we had, so it took a little bit more time in terms of analysis, because now instead of dealing with one bug, you have to deal with three bugs at three different layers of, of execution. Um, and the JavaScript was heavily obfuscated. And I'll let uh, Karthik talk about this a little bit. Sure, just uh, some brief. So that's a screenshot of uh, some of the JavaScript from that exploit. And, um, you know, definitely very complex, high potency, high resilience. Um, there was some variable name rewriting. And as with some of the targeted zero-day attacks, it was possible to um, use some Perl scripting to get through that layer. However, it wasn't comprehensive, and, and there were still a lot of uh, layers of uh, reverse engineering and, and debugging um, to be done at that point. What was interesting was uh, one of the variable names uh, was Diavolo. If you paid attention to the other uh, flash zero day, the font being loaded there was Diavolo. So at this point, Puss and I asked each other whether we should call the exorcist or continue debugging. We'll continue debugging. And of course, uh, this exploit used multiple um, reader extended features. And this was a record in terms of how many different kinds of versions of reader were supported. So in addition to the, in addition to the uh, particular point product versions, there's also subversions for three different languages, Arabic, Greek, and Hebrew. Um, and uh, versions ranging from 9, which uh, obviously doesn't have a sandbox, to 10, which does have a sandbox, to 11, which has a super sandbox, are all supported. And all those bugs that Pelish talked about, the information leak, um, the crash, and the sandbox bypass were chained effectively for all three, uh, for all these versions of, uh, of the exploit. So I'm going to turn it back to Pelish to talk about the fourth zero day we had to contend with. And uh, incidentally, these zero days are being presented in the order in which we encountered them. Right. So <clears throat> it was pretty impressive that to have a reader sandbox escape, uh, just sort of in general, because it was the first uh, reader X zero day we had seen in two years. Like when Karthik had 
talked earlier about the, the ones that we had seen the most of, from 2010. It was because it was the first rear zero day in the wild in, in over two years. Um, so they, they spent some time actually crafting it. Um, but right after that, we got the CV 2013-0648. And this was a Flash Player sandbox escape. So we have sandboxes for Flash Player in Chrome and Firefox. And we use protected mode in Internet Explorer. Uh, so this was a flash sandbox escape targeting Firefox. And again, um, this bug was a little interesting in that, in that we think we caught it in the wild. Um, well, not we. The person who reported it to us had caught it in the wild sort of when it was still under development because it, all the parts weren't quite there yet uh, in terms of, of what was there. But there was enough there to verify that they did have a zero day and that uh, there was enough there for us to actually issue patches for it. Um, the reason why I think it was still under development was because it, it targeted one single version of Flash Player. So I think that it was the version of Flash Player that the guy had on his machine and he was doing the development with. Um, and he's adding version support for other Flash versions probably would have come at the next stage. You know, get it working first in one version, then expand out. Um, it only targeted Firefox um, because the sandboxes are different between the, the different browsers. So the sandbox we use in, in Firefox is different than the one we use in Chrome. It's different than what we use for protected mode. Um, so if you're going to do a sandbox escape, you have to pick which browser you're going to go after because the techniques aren't uh, as universal in the different browsers. Um, but the action script for it supported MSIE, Chrome, <laughs> uh, Opera, and Firefox. So the actual initial shell code you know, that for getting control inside the sandbox, they were developing it out to be universal to work on all browsers. Um, we only found the one that had the uh, Firefox sandbox escape. So this was a bug that... They were trying to get the original craft to work for all, all, all browsers, including Chrome, and then they were pasting it together with the sandbox escape. And they had the one that we found was the sandbox escape for Firefox. Um, uh, it was a fairly complicated setup in order to get it to work. In order to, uh, this was not a, an attack you could deliver in an Office document because it required you to have a web page and it loaded two different Swifts uh, as part of the attack and part of the, the heap spraying technique they used. So this one was, uh, could only be deployed via the web because you need to be able to, uh, to have this, this set up. But uh, the, it's sort of an indication that people are starting to do sandbox escapes. They're starting to deploy multiple bugs. Uh, that particular uh, CVE, the way they got out of the sandbox, wasn't by finding a, a bug in Flash Player. What they did is they loaded another product um, that's separate from Flash Player, and they had a vulnerability in that, and then they got out that way. So... Uh, it was also a fairly interesting exploit in that they're, they're starting to see multi-product uh, attacks where they're combining bugs from different products, different vendors to be able to, to create the exploits that they need. It's not just like one self-contained bubble where it's completely all inside Flash Player, it's completely all inside Reader. They're, they're starting to mix and match what they've got. Um, <clears throat> and so in this next se section, now that we've covered the different zero days, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the digital evidence of commercialization that you can see. Um, and in the beginning of the talk, I used the phrase APT. If, if you've been in the industry for a while, you know that APT is sort of this overused term with, with sort of a vague definition. Um, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with the media, it's the phrase you throw out to explain how you got attacked. Um, if you're selling something, this is the, the magic threat that the security widget will protect you from. Um, but one of, the interesting things I, one of the interesting quotes I have from someone that I, I was talking to that worked for a three-letter agency um, was he basically considered an APT uh, any attack that involves a program manager. Any attack where you've got a group of people, you've got a program manager driving it, they have goals, they have objectives, they have timelines, uh, et cetera. And from those four zero days that we've looked at, you can see evidences of, uh, an evidence of a product manager. If you, if you look at the code and you try to infer back what the spec was by reading the code, uh, you can see requirements like support all versions of reader. The, the reader zero day that Karthik talked about supported 12 different versions, including uh, subversions for different languages. Uh, supporting all versions of Windows, even the server versions. We're, you know, it may not be practical to exploit somebody who's running server 2003, but they say all versions of Windows, you support all versions of Windows. Um, all current versions of Flash, you know, supporting all browsers, Firefox, Chrome, IE, Opera. Right, you can see, you can start to reflect out that there's uh, definitely sort of written to spec sort of things. And the complication behind these exploits is uh, getting more, uh, is growing as well. Like the slammer worm, I think, was what, like 376 bytes total? It was only 376 bytes? 
uh, the reader zero day, when Karthik and I were, were going through that, just the JavaScript portion, not the, the C code for the shell code and the assembly that went behind that, um, just the JavaScript and going through the JavaScript obf obfuscation, uh, depending on how you deal with carriage returns and JavaScript code, it was roughly uh, eight to 9,000 lines of, of just JavaScript code to, to set up the heap and uh, get everything ready so that you could then do the, the shell code layer of the attack and do the assembly layer of the attack. So uh, someone spent some time developing that. I mean, it was because that JavaScript code isn't you know, 8,000 lines of easy JavaScript code either, right? Because you're trying to do memory manipulation, getting things laid out, referencing things in the document model. This isn't just like they imported jQuery and that counted for like 10,000 lines. This is uh, handwritten, uh, obfuscated uh, code that they put together. And when I look at these, one of the things I sometimes think about is as the complexity of all this grows, as they start writing exploits to specs, like a lot of people are familiar with this, this cartoon about how software development happens, um, <clears throat> where you know this is what the customer needed, this is how the customer explained it, uh, this was how the project was described, right? Like every, a lot of people have probably seen this, this graphic. And you begin to wonder if, it, if the exploit development uh, becomes this, this complex where they're working from specs and they're, they're having to combine multiple products, um, is this what's going to happen to, to Boopin and the companies that are actually doing this on, uh, professionally? And, you know, are you going to end up with like 24-7 customer support hotlines for Boopin where it's like, hello, welcome to Boopin Technical Support. If your zero days mean you to detected by antivirus, please press one. If your zero day is not working correctly, please press two. Right? As, as it goes to this mass commercialization, like how, it's kind of curious to see how far it will actually go and whether um, you're going to start getting to, to exploits that sort of look like these. Um, and also looking towards the future, uh, as I said in the, in the talk, if you understand the business drivers and you look at it from a business perspective, you can actually use that to try to uh, come up with some conclusions about how you change how you do things technically, how do you change the response within your company, what's going to be coming down the road. Because all businesses sort of follow the same model regardless of the widget they're selling, whether it's an exploit or it's a chair or a car. They all go through the same evolution when it comes to, uh, to business development. So when we look towards the future, what does that, what does that mean? What, what does all this mean other than being kind of interesting uh, way of looking at things. And I think one of the things that we're going to see is we're going to see more focused attacks. And we're, we're starting to see this a little bit now, where in the past, Reader and Flash Player were targets of choice because uh, the ubiquity of the software, right? Microsoft uh, was very ubiquitous. Everyone went after Microsoft for a while. Once Microsoft got hard, they, they went after uh, Flash Player and Reader because we had ubiquity. Um, but if you have all this modularization and you have the ability to turn out zero-day code, uh, fairly quickly, and you, you can do this sort of speedy response, and you have all the parts, and you can you can assemble stuff fairly quickly. Going after larger, you know, going after smaller targets that don't have the same ubiquity in the market becomes much easier, because it it's just an interchangeable component at that point. So, uh, for instance, I, you know, there was a Flash Player zero day that that targeted Max. In the past, there weren't very many zero days that would target Max, and because uh, the, the ubiquity wasn't there, it wasn't very useful for the mass malware market. Uh, but now with zero days, you're gonna, we're going to start to see um, attacks that can go after Max, and they can take the time to do it because everything else is just an interchangeable part that they can plug and play uh, into these into these types of attacks. Um, and uh, one of the disadvantages for or <coughs> for vendors, and one of the advantages for the mass malware market, is that these interchangeable parts also make it much easier for the mass malware guys who are downstream. They just sort of copy and paste whatever the zero-day manufacturers are doing. It'll be much easier for them to componentize it for their, their malware packs, your Elnor, your black, your black hole, et cetera. Um, and we actually saw that with the reader zero-day. Because it was the first reader zero-day uh, in two years, the mass malware market uh, globbed onto it and it spread fairly quickly because now they finally had the PDF exploit they could use again. Everything else that they were using were, was like what Karthik described from 2010 and 2011. Now they had actually something new that they could go out and, um, and exploit. So the first generation of it was called Miniduke, and then there was Ida-Duke, which was like another phase of the attack, et cetera. So for the mass malware guys, as all these things become more componentized, uh, it should become slightly easier for them. 
Another point about uh, copyright attacks is the, uh, the bug, the uh, pwn to own bug submitted by George Hotz um, used the February Reader Zero Day as its template. So it was a different bug, but the, some of the techniques were copied right off the February Zero Day. Yeah, it, basically what he did is he took a Python script to substitute out the JavaScript from the, the Reader Zero Day and uh, copy his stuff in. Because he didn't really know the PDF file format, so he just wrote a Python script to move the parts around. <coughs> that was actually kind of a funny way to. Uh, to make it work, but you guys work. Um, another thing you're going to see with all of this componentization is you're going to see more multi-vendor, multi-product attacks. As Apple and, and Microsoft and Adobe, as we all make things harder to uh, uh, to attack, as we have become harder to attack, we're going to be raising the bar because Apple has sandboxing uh, application sandboxing now. Microsoft Windows 8 has sandboxing. Reader, Flash Player have sandboxing. Uh, so you're going to need more bugs to be able to, to achieve your attacks. And if you just look at many of the recent uh, attacks that we've seen, and some of the attack research that we've seen, you're starting to get to this multi-vendor, multi-product attack area. So uh, Pondo in 2013, uh, the Chrome sandbox was bypassed by going out through, through the Windows kernel. Uh, the Flash Player exploit also had an IE10 aspect to it, where they went out through... Uh, Flash player caused the crash, but then they had to get out of protection mode, so they needed an IE bug to, to continue the attack. Um, the Flash player zero day for the sam Firefox sandbox escape, that actually involved two different Adobe products. Flash player caused the crash, it got them the initial uh, control within the sandbox, and then they had to load another Adobe product to uh, escape the sandbox. And uh, Peter Brinkendehal, who, uh, who gave a talk on PDF sandboxes at CanSec West, one of the attacks that he demoed was a multi-product attack. He, would find, he found a crash from Reader and was able to get uh, control that way, but then the way he got out of there is he had an IE zero, zero day, which he used to, to break out the, the Reader sandbox by going out through IE. So um, you're going to start to see these more and more complicated attacks where uh, it's not going to just be one product. It's not going to be uh, just one vendor. And that's going to make things harder in terms of triaging these, these attacks. Um, just a couple of more examples. Uh, Ponium from 2012. Pinkie Pie got out of the Chrome sandbox using six different bugs. Uh, Glazunov got out using 14 different bugs to, to escape the sandbox. Right? So as a vendor, that's a lot of testing. You have to go and individually identify each one of those bugs. You have to be able to then create unit tests that target each one of those bugs. And creating unit tests isn't always easy because some of those APIs you can only reach once you have uh, binary level control inside the sandbox. So then you have to write uh, custom code to be able to hit all those layers and, and test, those, test those bugs. Uh, it means we have to pay greater attention to the shell code that we take a look at. For instance, one of the things I was thinking about from the, the Pondon exploit uh, from Bupin is, I started to ask myself, would I have caught the IE aspect of that zero day? Right? Someone would have sent it to me because they would have seen the flash player crash. I would have identified the flash player crash. I would have identified the flash player heap spray. But you know, I'd, ha I'd have to sit there and actually go through the assembly of the, of the exploit to actually see the IE zero day in there and be able to know that I have to go notify Microsoft because there's an IE component. Um, because I'm not equipped to test Internet Explorer. Um, you know, so. It means that we have to continue to take deeper and deeper looks to a absolutely understand every aspect of an exploit because there are going to be these more subtle bugs. The first bug is always easy to see, it's the, but the layered bugs, like the information leak and the reader zero day, um, those are things that you can only see if you sit there and really spend some time with the shell code and understand what's going on at each phase of the attack. And a related point to that is that um, you know, we as vendors who, um, who work with bugs that involve multiple products we might get false positive reports. So if someone who submits a bug, they think it's, it's in Flash Player, but in fact it's in another partner's product, and uh, we have to do the due diligence and take it right. apart, but uh, in the end it's really something involving another vendor, and we have to hand that over responsibly. Right, and we've had that case that happened to us in the past, where they may use Flash Player for the heap spray because they know Flash Player and how to do heap sprays in Flash Player, but it was actually a browser bug, and then we had to go and toss it over to the browser vendors because uh, we were just part of being used for the heap spray. So, um, in the, so we're going to have to have all these partnerships to be able to talk to all these different teams. And also, I made the point earlier about 
being able to uh, target things in, in, uh, for products that don't have as much popularity, that don't have the penetration. So with Vupin's bug, it's like, okay, if it's Microsoft, we have a good relationship with Microsoft. I know a dozen different people I can call if, it, if it's a bug in Microsoft. But if attackers get better and better at targeting specific individuals and knowing the individual's uh, specific machine information before they, they send the exploit, yeah, that, that vendor software may be very, um, uh, it may be a vendor that we've never heard of before, and then we're going to have to go be, reach out to them as part of the zero day response process. And then that adds steps to the zero day response process. Um, so we have to be able to plan for that. We have to be um, diligent in what we do. Um, the complexity may lead to some benefits for, um, for vendors and, and people on the defensive research side. Um, it will remain to be seen whether these actually uh, help or not. Uh, for instance, when you have these bugs, which are, you know, these attacks, which are 14 bugs long, you don't necessarily have to address all 14 uh, in the year immediate response, right? You want to get a patch out there that will kill what's the bug that's out there now, um, but you may have a little bit of time for addressing the rest of them. And so like Google did this with the Ponium research where they, the bug that they turned around in 24 hours to hit their 24 hour mark on Ponium, uh, they addressed a couple of the bugs and then some of the other more subtle bugs they addressed over time. So vendors may have a, the capability of picking which bugs that they're gonna choose to uh, strategically cut off the exploit until we can get to all of them. Uh, whether this is any help to AV or IDS vendors will be remain to be seen. As everything gets componentized, that's going to multiply the number of signatures that you have to have because you have to have signatures for all the different parts. Uh, but on the plus side, you might be able to be smart about what you create signatures on. You might be able to create uh, signatures on essentially the frame that everything is bolted onto as opposed to the things that are being bolted onto. So that might be something that helps AV IDS vendors sort of remains to be seen as a possible benefit. And then the one hope that I have is as they create more complex software, they will start dealing, having the same bugs that we do when we create complex software. It's sort of a small hope of mine, but we we'll see how it goes. Yeah, we can always hope that the bad guys push the button a little too quickly and there's no actual exploitation going on. We, we get the bug and we fix it before there's an actual exploit right. in the wild. Thanks, Bellis. Yeah. So what can we look to the future for and what hope is there for, for defenders and academics? There's actually a tradition of research into normalization of malicious executables to make malware more easily detectable by antivirus programs. So I'm going to talk about three different research groups and some of the stuff they've done, and uh, I think there's uh, something we can learn from, from these people. So Christo Dorescu et al.'s normalizer um, handles three kinds of code obfuscations, code reordering, packing, and junk insertion. Um, this other group, Lakodi and Mohammed, introduce a zeroing transformation of uh, malware code into normal form. The another group, Brishy et al., perform algebraic simplification and dead code elimination. Now, you could look at this and go, like, how does this apply to the rest of this talk and what we've been saying? Um, it's that the, the research and the direction that these people have advanced can be applied to lessons in deobfuscating JavaScript and normalizing JavaScript and compiled action script. And uh, these are open research topics for defenders and academics. So, in conclusion, we've summarized and use several case studies to point to a trend that mass malware features are being combined with multiple zero-day exploits, and we're starting to label that trend mass customized attacks. Now, this is a page out of a business textbook. And the reason that zero-day attacks are becoming mass customized attacks are manifold, but they're comparable to the reasons for the evolution of mass customization in other industries, as listed in this table from Joseph Pine's book, Mass Customization. Now, uh, defenders in other software companies could look at this and, uh, and go, you know, how do I explain the challenges in my day-to-day -day job with MBA types, and then use some of the uh, terminology here. So let's, let's walk through a few of these and how that argument could be made to people up the management chain. So if you look at cycle time reduction, quick response, and shortening product life cycles, Pellis talked at length on this topic, but what it comes down to is that uh, Adobe's uh, patching and quick response is putting pressures on the exploit writers to do things a little different. Continual improvement. Uh, Pellis talked about a zero date in Flash Player, which was originally targeting Macs, but later was repurposed for Windows. That's an example of continual improvement. There might have been a customer who was only running Windows and not Mac, and, and so the people who wrote the exploit repurposed it for Windows. Regional marketing globalization. For several of the exploits we discussed, 
there is customized shellcode and operating system version supported, including language pack differentiation. And that's an example of globalization and uh, regional marketing. Just in time production. We noticed that on exploit kits, you can swap modules in and out. Some of the same things are being seen with uh, exploits these days, with multiple exploits being bundled up to, to one attack. So in conclusion, we're seeing that the features of mass malware, when combined with zero day, targeted zero-day attacks, and the bundling of multiple zero-day attacks into a single attack, are the next coming trend of mass customization and exploits. And uh, what can we do as defenders? Pellis is going to uh, talk a little bit about that. Right. So, <clears throat> uh, so when we talk about mass customization, one of the concepts is you know flexible manu manufacturers of systems and, and product mod modularization. And so what we have to do is a little bit of mass, uh, mass customization on our side to be able to, to match the, the innovation that they're doing on their side. And uh, there's going to be some challenges that we're going to have to deal with in terms of meeting that goal. For instance, when you're dealing with these multi-bug attacks, your response time is going to be somewhat sl slowed because you have to be able to go and test all those uh, bugs, find them all, research them all, it's not going to be as quick as, oh, you go find the crash, it's a string copy, change it from a string copy to a string end copy or some other function and, and ship it out the door. You're gonna, we're going to be spending more time uh, taking a look and taking apart these zero days before we, we turn around the response. Uh, so we need to be able to make sure that our response is going to be proportional to the complexity that we're seeing. Um, we're going to have to look through all the shell code, make sure that we reverse all the shell code and read it through, so if, they, you know, if we have a Flash Player zero day that also has an IE zero day that we are able to notify Microsoft in time uh, so that they can get a head start on their, their portion of the response. And we have to be prepared for those types of situations. Like we, you have to have a game plan in place so that you know to, how to be able to contact those under other vendors, you know, have those relationships built up. It'll be easy if it's you know, one of the top companies because we have relationships with Apple and with Microsoft um, and, and, and Google. But it may be harder if they, if they start to become very targeted, if they start to hit uh, very specific software, because then we have to be able to go out and find those teams, find their, their response teams, et cetera. So it'll be interesting to see how this, this changes going forward. Uh, in terms of cycle time reduction, uh, sharing product, uh, products, we have to be able to uh, be on our toes at all times to be able to have the quick response, right? We have to be scaled up enough that if we get a, bug, you know, if we get a zero day that has three bugs, we have enough team members in place to be able to go through and find all those bugs, test all those bugs in roughly the same amount of time that we do for a traditional zero day or, or like a 2008 zero day where we had, to, we had to turn it around. So we have to be scaled to deal with that. Um, and part of what we're doing is an increased rate of update. So for instance, with the Flash Player, we're, we're pushing once a month now so we can proactively get patches out fairly quickly. Um, but that also gives us the ability to have trains which are going out the door uh, every month. So when we do get a zero day, there's a train uh, that's likely going to be coming soon that we can toss that patch into and, and get it out the door to customers to be able to protect them. Um, and this is really going to push vendors towards defense in depth uh, for things that are meta bugs. For instance, uh, heap sprays. Heap sprays aren't technically a bug in and of themselves. Um, it's just sort of a byproduct of working with virtual machines. There was a paper recently on how to do heap sprays in HTML5. Basically, you can do these in almost any virtual machine, and there's uh, defense and depth that you can put in place. But as we move towards these multi-bug attacks, APIs that we thought used to be safe because they were buried you know, behind data validation, which happens up front, those will become more exposed. People are going to start prodding those, those, API, you know, those internal APIs, which they may not have gone after before. So we have, to, we have to take a look at sort of meta patches, like how do we harden our virtual machines against things such as heap sprays. And we also have to spend time looking at those defense in depth uh, features, because as soon as they get those initial crash and they get control inside the sandbox, then they're going to be going after all those internal APIs um, or things that we, th we thought typically wouldn't be targetable in a traditional attack. But now that they're doing multi-bug and they're combining stuff, we're going to have to spend a little bit more time doing that, and we also have to have robust patching testing in place so that we can test all those things, so that we can test bugs that are for APIs that are buried inside the application and that aren't directly exposed. Um, so 
you know, be able to call the sandbox APIs directly, to be able to call uh, some of the internal APIs directly. Because they are getting better and better at what they do. For instance, I include this Twitter uh, capture from Aaron Portnoy, who works for Exodus Intel. Um, and uh, he's a good guy. He's not, um, he's not the guy who's typically dropping zero days on us or anything like that. He's actually a pretty good guy. He responsibly discloses stuff to us. We work with this company. He's got a good company. Uh, but one of the things that he does is he helps uh, weaponize exploits uh, as part of what he does within his company. And, you know, you can see that he's, he has the capability of not only bypassing, you know, Deputy SLR, but he also has techniques for going after EMET protected machines. So even if you have EMET installed, um, he's working on techniques to be able to bypass EMET. So, uh, the, you know, it's a continual race to be able to keep up with what their, their capabilities and, and to be continually adding these layers of defense in depth to, to be able to protect uh, in these environments. And that's why you see some of the operating system vendors like Apple and Microsoft putting sandboxing into the desktop application spaces because it's a cooperation between all of us to be able to have this many layers of defense uh, to be able to deal with this, this sort of increasing rate uh, that comes from mass customization, the quick response, and the quick turnaround. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and take uh, any questions you guys have. If you have if you want to be able to reach out to us, uh, this is our contact information. You can send us emails with questions from the talk. Uh, you may also see us floating around our booth. We have a booth over in the vendor area uh, where we'll also be able to take questions. Um, but any questions now that people have? Questions from the floor? Here. Um, sure. I was just wondering how much effort's being put into fixing the bugs before they're exploited as opposed to patching them after they've been exploited. Um, so we, we do have a, a security software development lifecycle where we, we're constantly looking for uh, <coughs> vulnerabilities and we're testing through uh, internal fuzzing efforts, proactive stuff, using stack analysis tools, all those things that you, you would expect. Uh, we also work with our partners. For instance, Flash Player is distributed through uh, groups like Google. So if you look at the monthly updates, uh, we are not only are we looking at our software to, to find the vulnerabilities, but we also have Google taking a look. They're reporting vulnerabilities to us. Uh, many of the other partners that we work with, uh, RIMS reported vulnerabilities to us in the past. So one of the advantages that Flash Player has right now is that because we work with so many partners, it's not just our security uh, response team that's looking at for vulnerabilities, but also others. Um, and it's, if you uh, saw some of the quotes from Bupin, from Pondone, uh, we did get at least a little justification that we're making things harder because uh, the quotes, and you know, he was quoted as saying, you know, Flash player is getting much harder for us to exploit. So we're, I think we're, uh, it's, it's a continual process. Um, we're, we're always working to find and solve vulnerabilities. But we're, uh, the work that we've been doing has actually been uh, paying off. And the other thing that we're doing, in addition to just going after crashes, crash, just going after crashes is just sort of a, a race. And it's a very hard race to win. Um, so the, the layer, you know, the defense and depth features that we put in place have helped. So for instance, with Reader, like I said, the Reader Zero Day that we had was the first one in two years since we deployed the sandbox. Um, so we were able to, you know, get, uh, spread the exploits out. And with Flash Player, we've done a number of things, such as, um, as I mentioned, we have click to play in Office now. So even if you have a crash, if you're going to try to send out through a malicious Word document, we've added a layer of defense there that the user has to now click through this extra dialogue, which says, you know, and the dialogue is phrased such that it basically says, Flash Player typically doesn't run in Word. Uh, you probably don't want to run this. By default, it says click no. So then if you, even, then if you have a crash, like we've, we've made, taken steps to make that, uh, the delivery of those exploits much harder. Um, there's someone back there. That, we have time for one last question. Sure. OK. Yeah. Hi. Um, I like the way that Adobe has stepped up uh, with the sandboxing and the rapid response, um, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the protected view in uh, Reader 11. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that annoys me is that uh, users want to do two things with PDFs. They want to read them, they want to print them. Okay. Uh, printing, you have to disable the protected view. Is, is it ever going to be possible to do that from within the protected view? Okay, so you're referring to the fact that the prompt, there's a prompt there for when you want to go print. Right. Um, <clears throat> right, so the, the prompting on printing there is uh, device drivers tend to be in a, f a favorite way of attacking environments. So in order to be able to print, you've got to be able to go through that. So we've, 
uh, we have the click there just to make sure that when you open up a malicious PDF, you don't go attack a printer driver. Um, so it's, it, I understand it's a, a step that's annoying, and we're always sort of refining what we do, with, we do around that, but there is a, a reason that we, we have that click there. Right, but so uh, printing is always going to be unsafe. That's what you're saying. Um, Re reading is okay from an individual right. point of view, but if you want to print, you open yourself up to more vulnerabilities. Yeah, if, in some cases you may. Um, so we just have that step there so that you have a chance to look at the PDF and make sure it's a, a PDF you recognize before you, you go to that next step. Right. right? Because if you open it up in this PDF and it's you know, garbage, which a lot yeah. of exploits are, then with, you're with not going to immediately hit print. Yeah, but with APTs, the, 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 the few will be, will be looking something that's interesting to you. So, right. Yeah, OK. So but, we're, yeah. we're still working on that. I mean, we've, uh, we updated the reader. I mean, we're, we're continually working on the reader sandbox. With reader 11, we added uh, new protections where we run it on a separate uh, desktop and a separate workstation. Um, and we're going to continue to refine it going forward. Um, I don't know when we'll, we'll be able to address that, but we'll continue to refine it going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pilius, Kartik. Please join me in thanking them for their Thank session you. today.